On this episode of What's Going On With Chipping, the top five stories of 2022. I'm your host, Sal Mercagliano. Welcome to this episode. So we are joined for our end of the year special with our frequent guest, John Conrad, Captain, CEO over at GCAP. And John, how are you doing today? It's great to be here, Sal. How are you? I'm, I'm doing great, John. Listen, I'm sorry. It's been a very quiet year in shipping. So I, I don't know if we're going to be able to pull up five top stories between the two of us at all. I, I just don't think anything really exciting has happened at all. Holy cow, John. <laughs> I just I, I went through this list. I was trying to figure out what I wanted to talk about. And I got to say, man, I could, I could have done a top 25, a top 50 based on the number of stories we've seen. And, you know, I just saw the post from GCAP with the top 10 stories from GCAP this year. I, I know that you guys have been hammering out stories left and right. So I figured we will do what we did last year, Wimbledon style. We'll go back and forth, starting at the bottom, working our way up to the top. So I thought I'd start off with you, John. What, what was your number five story for the year? Right, and I apologize because it was really hard to get uh, get this narrowed down to to five stories, and um, you know, and in the U Ukraine's obviously the the really big uh, story um, for everyone. Not not a spoiler alert for you, everyone. Well, and, and I should mention, John and I have not coordinated our stories, so we're going to see where they fall. So we we just we always like to do this kind of unrehearsed. So we're going to see how our stories fall and where we place things. So go ahead, John. So don't don't yell at us if we missed big things because we know it, it, this was the hardest uh, year we've ever had to do this. Just the sheer volume of stuff coming in. But and my my number five is going to be a little not controversial, but why is it in the top five? Uh, my top five is uh, our article, uh, rest in peace trade lens, the blockchain uh, collaboration between Maersk and IBM. This was a uh, big, big deal back in 2016, 17, and then really ramped up in 18. Um, I, I'm really bringing this up for one specific topic. Uh, and this this died, their blockchain effort died. They wanted to put all of Freight, all of the containers. Uh, Maersk wanted to track everything globally, pretty much, on the blockchain. Uh, so this with really SBF, um, and and the crash of cryptocurrency this ties in well to kind of macro global events but i really entered it here to uh, kind of as a warning of the the greatest thing we we have a very short term memory and when we get overloaded especially with news stories it's hard to to see the forest from the trees sal and when I was going to conferences in 2018, and I was working up at, at IBM with BlackSail, a, a researcher on uh, AI, and we were trying to get funding for, uh, for some safety systems on the bridge. And all anyone could talk about, though, was blockchain. You went to a conference, and they were all like, this is the big new thing. And there were 20 30 startups all getting funded for blockchain cryptocurrency thing and then you know over the last year two years of the pandemic so much more has happened that people kind of forgot about all the hype of the blockchain and now um Maersk and ibm announced the death of uh trade lens that it was a failed project and this was a giant project uh it's hard to get exactly how much was spent. Uh, one website quoted $170 million on this project, um, but but it's it's completely uh, failed and been closed up by Maersk. You know, Maersk has run into a number of troubles, and uh, I think Maersk is a big part of this story too. They went from the largest um, container shipping company in the world uh, to number two. And uh, part of this story is really them bringing in these high powered consultants who really go and chase the newest, greatest thing. Um, McKinsey is uh, their, their latest, uh, you know, their consultants. They pay millions upon millions of dollars for these consultancy firms that really tend to chase the next best thing. Um, and, and the New York Times just had a uh, book about, um, about uh, McKinsey, when McKinsey comes to town. 
chasing, you know, looking at everything from the big collapses that were uh, created by McKinsey alumni, especially uh, Enron, uh, to, to the automobile manufacturing collapses, to transportation collapses. And now we have a secretary of uh, transportation, uh, Pete Buttigieg, who's an alumni of McKinsey. And we're ch now chasing, you know, we've all forgotten about blockchain. And now the big thing is ESG, right? ESG carbon credits, let's reduce the carbon footprint and um, there are all various, you know, I'm a big supporter of ESG. Uh, this is not anti-ESG um, at all, but taking the ESG and then seeing, you know, each, you know, now Maersk with McKinsey's help is pushing methane ships. Uh, so I still believe in blockchain. I believe in cryptocurrency. I think the big ones like Bitcoin and uh, Ethereum are going to do well, but you know, McKinsey and um, is, is their projects going to work? Are Merck's Tradelands projects going to work? So taking the, the big thing and then these mega companies and uh, large scale consultants kind of running their own way, uh, I think this should be a warning. This Tradeland should be a warning to the next big thing, which right now is ESG. Now, I, you know, I can remember uh, the the impact trade lens was having and the stories you guys were writing at G Captain and all the other sites too about it, especially after the uh, cyber attack on Maersk with the Napietia virus. And I, again, I, I think you're right about this. I think it's a, it's a huge story in many ways and it's really eclipsed because right now Maersk is swimming in profits like all the other container companies are and they can go ahead and cut this loose without a huge substantial loss. I don't know if they can do this prior to the profits they had without really being a huge problem for them and, and again it goes back to that whole issue of of what's the next big thing coming forward and how do you manage and operate in this new environment and, and you're right i i think it links right into crypto it li links right into a lot of the issues and when that story came out the other day i remember it's like man this is huge and it did not resonate at all with most people because again most people's attentions to shipping came with the supply chain crisis not so much prior to that and realizing how much supply chain was involved there so no, I think it's a good. Uh, it really, good... it really got no views, and that's why I really wanted to highlight it. And again, it's not just the trade lens, but being very wary of not wary because we need that innovation, right? Yep. We need to push forward. We need companies like Merce willing to push trade lens. But the problem with trade lens, it wasn't fully um, encompassing the the crypto. It had an open and closed blockchain. So some things were private and some things were public and it was very much a MERS product as is methane now with ESG. And uh, you have to be wary of these, these large pushes by very wealthy. And now exactly right with these profits, some of these yeah. companies have real money to kind of push their own prerogative uh, in these areas. Well, and they're going to be able to push an agenda, which is going to be interesting to see how it happens. So, all right. Well, that was a great, great way to start off, John. Thank you so much. I'm going to give you my number five story. And my number five story goes back to the origins of this channel. I got it. I have to talk about an, an, an ever, evergreen ship being stuck in the springtime. And, and that that was ever forward coming out of Baltimore. I went back and looked at, uh, you know, year long stories. And, and for quite a few month or two there, it was, it was all ever forward. We were talking about coming out of Baltimore. And, you know, I don't want to talk so much about Everford because I don't think that was the story as much. I think it had more to do with issues that you and I have talked about a long time, and that's infrastructure in the United States. And, you know, one of the things that Everford demonstrated, first off, we, we just talked about the fact that this was a pilot issue and, and it was a pilot being distracted and not paying attention and a loss of situational awareness. And it took nine months to figure this out. And why it took nine months, that's a whole other issue. But I think the thing it really highlighted for me is the danger we're seeing in US ports and ports around the world for the potential to be shut down and not have the capacity to open themselves back up. Uh, we've had three kind of near misses this year of that. You had Ever Forward coming out of Baltimore. You had the Maersk Surabaya coming into Savannah that got stuck. And then just the other day, we had a ship coming out of Brunswick, Georgia, another car carrier coming out, a Liberian uh, fl uh, flag car carrier, the Treasure coming out that almost blocked the channel again. And this goes back to the infrastructure in US ports. And I'm not talking about gantry cranes and I'm not talking about lay down area. 
I'm talking about the, the the basics. We're talking about dredging. We're talking about tugs. We're talking about firefighting. We're talking about all those elements that are necessary as these vessels get much bigger, much larger, as the pace accelerates, as the tempo increases. We are operating ships on a on almost a, a full out schedule right now. We saw that during the supply chain. And, you know, that's when accidents start happening. And, you know, you can handle some forms of accidents. You, you, you can, we can manage them. However, I think the one thing that Everforward demonstrated is how these large Neo Panamax vessels are a beast unto themselves. I, I mean, for the first time ever, you had to offload a container ship grounded. I, I mean, I, I can't think of a ship that size in 20 years since we've had these massive vessels of, that we had to do that. Uh, we haven't had to take containers off. You had to take 500 containers off. You had to dredge several hundred thousand cubic yards of, of, of soil to get them off. And fortunately, that ship went clear out of the channel, didn't block the channel. And it went into an area that was basically spoiled from the channel anyway. So it didn't do any real environmental damage. But that should have been a, a wake-up call for a lot of people around the country of the danger of these ships operating. And we've had, again, these close calls. And unfortunately, what Ever Given showed us two years ago, where we started this all, uh, is is how precarious the global supply chain is, and how one vessel can basically shut off trade. If that vessel had shut off trade to Baltimore, if Brunswick or Savannah had been cut off, that could have been catastrophic for a long period of time. And, and again, you know, we see the visibility of these ships today more than ever, thanks to G Captain, thanks to my channel, and, and everything else we do. We raise the visibility of this, but I, I think we don't really appreciate how thin margins we're operating under in making these vessels safe. And again, it only takes one accident. And, and what we saw with Ever Forward was it was just human error. Somebody on his computer typing an email and missed a channel. And, and you know, you can't really fix that in some ways and it always comes down to you know it's either human or mechanical and most of the time it, it's human error and i think that's something that you and i have talked about a lot is the danger that this pace we're setting and it's a topic i know you've talked about a lot with infrastructure in u.s ports and around the world yeah it's an excellent point Alan. and you have just I, I didn't dive deep into that one incident because you and mike Schuler were just doing such excellent coverage that you know, I, I, I've obviously read your stuff, um, but did not research it deeply myself. But I think that infrastructure thing is critical. We've gone down, some of these ships are, a lot of these mega container ships are larger than an aircraft carrier, which has 5,000 people. You know, a lot of these mega ships will have under 25 people, some under 20 people. And how do they do that? They really rely on the shoreside infrastructure. They bring in mechanics, they bring in things. Well, that's great for um, loading and unloading, um, but you also need that emergency response and they rely on the ports and local thing. I think an interesting thing here is to look at, you know, other incidents that, that were complete failure you you were really leading the charge on the bonham richard the uh the huge navy ship that caught fire and was scrapped in san diego the lack of fire boats there but i also want to bring in the positive side and the near misses and i can't believe it was actually at the end of it's over a year now into 2021 but the zim kingston mm. i mean the canadians really did an excellent job uh, the Canadian Coast Guard had the assets. They had these multi-purpose vessels with fire monitors. They got there very quickly. There were some mistakes made. There was an argument between the Canadian Coast Guard and the captain. Uh, Coast Guard wanted to get the captain off. Captain says, I'm saving nope. the ship. Uh, but uh, the captain stayed and he had that support. He had multi-purpose vessels with cranes to move containers and, and the firefighting equipment. It was there and disaster averted right it, it works when you have that stuff yeah I, I think i think again that's an excellent point you know where you have the positives and then you know go back again a, a complete negative earlier in 2021 the express pearl you know which was lost off of sri lanka and and you can see that and, and again I, I think those are the wake-up calls that we need to be talking about in ports around the united states because of the high volume the high capacity we're doing you know chances are more likely for accidents to happen especially as we're increasing the flow of goods around the world. And, and we're seeing that. Uh, 
All right, John, that was a good number five from us. So let's go ahead and jump into story number four. So what's your story number four? My top number four is uh, just the prolific shipyard troubles. I mean, one of our top stories was GE's uh, shipyard unpaid supercarrier bills. That GE isn't getting paid for uh, supercarrier work. Uh, then there was the uh, CNO chief of naval operations talk about the rust, you know, saying that the rust is unacceptable on all these Navy ships. Well, we don't have the work yards. Um, you know, we, we, so it's, it's not just new bill yards that are building our carriers in the U S but it is also these repair yards in the U S we don't have enough of them. They're not working to full efficiency. Um, and then it's just not a U.S. problem. You have the giant bailouts of Korean shipyards uh, by Korea. And then, you know, one of our biggest stories of the year was the bankrupt cruise line Genting, uh, this Hong Kong based cruise line. And in the bankruptcy of this cruise line, the cruise line had actually bought a shipyard in Germany. Uh, and they were in the middle of building a ship. Now the Disney Cruise Line is going to take over that ship and finish it out. And it looks like they are going to convert that shipyard in Germany into building Navy sh uh, ships and submarines with all of this um, problems. But you, you have this as China's shipyards just dominate the new build sector uh, and now the repair sector we have Matson and uh pasha sending u.s flag ships to be repaired in china it's a huge national security but it's also a, a just global problem as china dominates but then you know on the other side of this you everyone thinks it's impossible oh and with the shipyard you have one of the us's largest uh, the the halter sale there's enormous sh shipyard selling for pennies pennies on the dollar uh with the icebreaker they're building the icebreaker they have billions and billions in contracts but just sold for a few uh, million dollars so you you think what can we do with china absolutely collapsing even u.s shipyards that have these multi-billion dollar uh things they're struggling the market capitalization of our most our largest most important uh shipyard uh huntington angles in the u.s is one quarter uh the price elon musk paid for twitter uh even the successful ones have low value but there is some you know silver lining you have alabama shipyards um it was one of our top 20 stories being uh taken over by a young ceo he's actually a classmate of my wife's at suny maritime college and really taking this shipyard that was uh in big trouble and about to collapse and reworking things to just focus on some repair work and uh, really protecting those jobs and, and starting to turn a profit there, but facing significant headwinds. And the Navy's not helping. The Navy says our yards do not have the capacity. We hear it over and over from the Navy. And I've talked to all these shipyards out. And there's, there's plenty, of, plenty of capacity here in the U.S. and loads more capacity with our allies in Korea and Germany they're all struggling here and i think it's just a, a a giant giant story um that adds up i i, I gotta say john because my story number four literally was u.s navy and this is one of the key things and again we didn't coordinate these at all but this, we, we knew this was going to happen and, and uh, my story was right along those lines you know our good buddy chris cavis and sam legrone chris cavis who has his own podcast sam legrone over at usni news did a tour down in the Gulf Coast of the shipyards. And one of the things they came back with is, you know, firsthand information. They sat there and said, listen, there's capacity in these Gulf yards there. They want to build more. And, and I think you're right. I, I think one of the things we're seeing is the Koreans bailing out their shipyards. Two billion dollars did a story on that, you know, where they're shoveling that money in. China is, is once again the powerhouse, 44 percent of the world's ships being built in China. We see that number going up every year. And it's not, again, you know, back in the day when you can make fun of Chinese ships, that was 20 years ago, not anymore. Now they're building quality vessels and more sophisticated vessels. They're getting in the LNG, they're getting into gas carriers. They're getting in the cruise lines. They're gonna run uh, the cruise line companies, uh, the shipyards in Europe out of business probably. 
because they're going to start mass producing cruise liners too. And, and you're right. I, you know, I, I think you hit on a great topic there because again, what I was going to talk about is that disconnect between the U.S. Navy and the commercial side. But and, one second with the Chinese shipyards, now you have them slowing down because of this COVID. Yeah. There were massive shutdowns. You you did a great interview um, uh, about the American ship caught there with the shutdowns. And now that they're opening up, COVID spreading enormously. So will China be able, this, this is a big part of the story, will they be able to meet the global demand for shipbuilding or are we going to have a... a complete vacuum a, a shortage of ships if china stumbles and falls here and the korean the american and the european shipyards can't can't retake that capacity yeah we did you know interviewed madeline walchko on the president wilson uh that was an apl ship that got stuck in the shipyard in shanghai supposed to be in for 30 something days they were in there for over 100 because basically one afternoon the crews walked off for lunch and never came back and then they were in that lockdown and, you know, a, a lot of critics of the U.S. Merchant Marine highlight that story and sit there and say, well, look, they, they, here's this U.S. ship, you know, getting repair work in China. They're in China getting repair work because that's where the yards of availabilities are. That's where the space is. On the West Coast, you're really limited on the availability of space. You know, you have, you know, yards in San Diego. You've got Vigor up in, up in uh, Portland. You have Seattle, Tacoma. You have the Bay Area. But there's not a lot, and especially when you're competing against U.S. Navy vessels and U.S. government vessels. And I, I think that highlights it a lot. I, I think for my story for, you know, what I was going to talk about is the U.S. Navy shipbuilding plan, which is completely unrealistic. It, it, it's it, it's absolutely not a, a thing that it succeeds, you know, because it's taking them seven to eight years to build one aircraft carrier. If you want to have 10 aircraft carriers and, you know, you have a 50 year service life, you need to be building these things every five years. But they're not doing that. They're not sustaining the numbers. And I think one of the reasons is if you look at na countries that have large merchant marines and large navies, they're China, Japan, and Korea. And they're complementary. They have building facilities. They're building in those yards, both commercial and military vessels. China is building vessels for overseas. So is Korea. So is Japan. Uh, they, they sustain them. They support them. They give them subsidies. Look at what Korea just did. Look what China does on a daily basis. And I think you're right. The Jennings story was one that flew below the surface that should have resonated with a lot of people that here's this cruise company, but they also own a shipyard, MV Vert, and, and that went under. And you lost cruise ships that were being built. You lost the shipyard. You lost all that capacity. And now you see Germany scrambling to take over that shipyard and they're going to build submarines in a shipyard designed to build cruise ships. And, and, you know, that's going to be an interesting reconfiguration there. But I, I think the U S Navy in particular, especially Admiral Gilday, the chief of Naval operations has been a bit detached from this. His, his stories have not been the same. There's not a consistency in what he's saying. He say he's saying that there's no excess capacity in the U S when the U S yards are saying that we have plenty of capacity. We just need funding. We just need the authorization to go ahead and build. You can't stop production of a ship class and then start it back up again, like hitting an on-off button. When you, when you stop building Burke class destroyers and try to restart them back up again, that doesn't work. You, you've already moved on to the next class. And then when you cancel that new class, it, it's really hard. There's no consistency here. And I think you know one of the things that you've talked about a lot is the fact that Korea, for example, really wants to get a foothold into U.S. when it comes to shipbuilding. And I think there's a lot the U.S. could learn from Korean shipbuilding. A lot of people want to, you know, just farm this out. Let, let Korea build our ships. Let Japan build our ships. But I don't think it's a good idea for 95% of our all. But there, but there needs to be some sort of working together. Korean has these amazing plans. U.S. still has this amazing base of, you You talk about the American Bureau of Shipping doing excellent things of providing the services and the Korean plans. And now Philly Acre is, that's the other success story right. is building this ship, but it's not these crazy designs. They've stripped out the bureaucracy. They've outsourced a lot to Korea, but retained the jobs in the U.S. I have major problems with some aspects of that, but the Navy should be looking at this and there's no lack of capacity. 
there's no problem building. Everyone says the shipyards are, are in cities. Yes, they are. But you see with Korea, you just need a dry dock and a scissor lift grain and you can you can add capacity rather quickly. But there's also no shortage of talent. And the one number I keep getting back to and back to with the Navy is there are over 80,000 employees of NAVC. And I've met a lot of these. These are some of the most talented, the, the most capable, the most well-educated uh builders and engineers and designers in the world but the fact is they are working on bureaucracy sal they're filling out forms they're jumping through hoops that is a huge workforce i remember when i was in samsung there were 40,000 shipyard workers and they'd all come on their scooters you it's chapter one of my book fire on the rise and you can read about it and it was just like this overwhelming number of people all coming in between eight and ten you know they had to have staggered because it was just this <laughs> moped so i can visually see what forty thousand eighty thousand is twice that that is a huge art uh, the entire air wing of uh, the Navy um, nav air is is only forty thousand but you take those together it's all it's 120,000 people working on aviation and, and, and ships and the talent of these and that we can't motivate them to solve these problems. You give me 80,000 people, I will build some ships. <laughs> no, but the Navy know, can't do it with that huge number of talented, talented people. No, and, and, you know, and, and again, there's different philosophies that you have and, and, you know, you can't really go into a shipyard with plans only 80% complete and, and make these changes. You need to have a mindset where, okay, this is what we're going to go with and we'll make changes later. And, you know, you're seeing that, like you mentioned with Philly and Acre, uh, the national Marit uh, national security multi-mission vessel that's being built for the uh, five state maritime academies that are on the coast. Uh, you're seeing a program that's developing. And I think it's a good one. It's a good model to be looking at. And you see some, you know, I, I would argue we're seeing some changes here. We're seeing some provisions in the congressional bills coming out to build 10 roll on roll off ships through Marriott. We're seeing some of this being done, but I would argue again, we need to really emphasize that more. And I think the Navy needs to understand that, you know, the, the fate and fall of the commercial side, both the commercial merchant Marine and then the shore side infrastructure that supports it has a impact on them and i think they they failed to see that lots of times all right well we overlapped on our number four stories so that worked out perfectly let's go ahead and jump to our number three stories then john so what's your number three back to the u.s navy um uh, number three story is really the navy's complete and total i'm gonna get i'm gonna get criticism for this because they are flying some uh, you know p3s and other aircraft in the area and they're they're giving the Ukrainians some anti ship missiles, but they're they're near complete and total absence from the Black Sea and the real change in the geopolitics of that. Um, we're giving a lot of support to the uh, land forces in the Ukraine, and they're doing amazing things there. But uh, the the sea is we we've, we've really given over control uh, to the Russians and and the Turks. And uh, the, the Black Sea is not entering the news. It's not entering the conversation. It's not talked about by the White House. Uh, the Maritime Administration, which has to give security alerts for the entire world, uh, you know, has updated the Black Sea security alert. Like just, I, I can count on my right hand how many times <laughs> they did since the beginning of this war. Um, it's, they're, they're, it's just being, the, the naval aspect of this war is being completely and utterly um, ignored uh, other than a few high profile like the sinking of the Moskva, but we, we had very little to do with that other than providing some, some weapons. Um, but the, this is really uh, the first time that the U.S. Navy has really back down from from a conflict and i know there are problems and they say well you know sending a destroyer in there would be sitting ducks but there's a lot that could be done with uh, mine layer vessels lend the lease to nato uh you know the, the romanians there working with turkey um and and they've kind of pushed that off to the imo and we got the grain un grain deal out of that but Turkey's really taking control of that, but 
you know, everyone's looked at the Nord Stream, but they're under the Black Sea is LNG, or they're not liquefied, I don't believe, but uh, gas pipelines gas, yeah. called Turk Stream that are just as important as the Nord Stream. And, you know, um, this is providing low cost gas to Turkey, which Turkey very much wants and very much needs. And no one's talking about the economic, you know, the alignment of uh, Turkey and the Black Sea and the Bosphorus Straits and the critical aspect this has on trade right after the ever given uh, Vladimir Putin announced they were spending billions of dollars on their inland waterway system. And, you know, all of that inland waterway, all of those barge traffic and grain traffic and oil traffic, they all have to go past Mariupol. Mariupol was, you know, shelling uh, this. So the Navy's not, it's not only backed out of the Black Sea, but it's also backing out of, uh, you know, the entrances to choke points to Russia's enormous um, the Caspian Sea and Riverine system, and then the the, the Danube, and also our, our NATO um, allies in the Western Black Sea. Yeah, you know, our good buddy uh, Charlie Brown on Twitter will always post the fact that the, the, the previous NDAA required the Navy to come up with a choke point report, and they have yet to do that. And, and I, I, I think, you know, you and I have both been very critical of the Navy regarding this issue of freedom of the seas. And, and we've, re- we've gotten a little, just, just a, a scotch of uh, <laughs> anger Pushback. comments from uh, naval officers about yeah, it. I don't know about a scotch. I think we got a ton of them, but myself. But anyway, uh, I, I got to say, uh, you know, I, I agree with you entirely on this one, too. You know, I, I my problem is is kind of the the dichotomy here is the Navy will sit there and push destroyers through the Taiwan Straits and stick it in China's face all the time. They have no problem being right in their face with China all the time. Yet here you have armed aggression. And it's not like we're not playing And before sides the here. invasion, they did that with Russia. We had a lot of close yeah. calls in the Black Sea. I mean, that was a yearly news article for GCAP and the and 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 I, and I know everyone's screaming right now, Montreux Convention, Turkey, and all this stuff. And and you know, should it be the U.S. Navy? Then NATO. I mean, you have mines loose in the in the Black Sea. I mean, you have li- you literally had NATO doing a mine sweeping exercise about a hundred miles from there in the Aegean Sea. It's like, all right, get NATO, get the Turks to allow a passage of NATO minesweepers into the area and put them in. Let's be visible with the Bulgarian. You know, again, half the Black Sea is is. Tur- well, they NATO talked nations. about it. Italy said that they were going to send minesweepers. The UK yep. said they would send minesweepers, and they just never happen. It goes back to the trade lens. There are all of these announcements that happen, and when all this big stuff happens, everyone forgets about it. So it's not just the Navy presence in the Black Sea. It's the Navy mind share in the Black Sea. The Navy's not thinking about this. They're not planning this. They're not putting it out. They're not writing articles. Naval officers aren't writing articles and proceedings in SIMSEC. Yep. The CNO is not talking about this. The Secretary of the Navy has not been to the, go visit the Black Sea. Go visit Turkey. Go visit Romania. Show the flag. It's just not, it's like we've we've completely backed out. I understand, and you and I said we should send, I still stand by that. I think it's worth the risk. The CNO said we're not escalating that, but at least come back and and stand behind those partners and 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 bring bring Romania to RIMPAC and every other nation bring them you know show them put them on the the front pedestal say how important they are how much we back them there, there's no forget you know the the king's point famous motto uh, act a non verb actions not words forget the actions i'll just take some words at this point you know anything well, uh, anything let's... Let's remember too, the Black Sea is an international sea. It's not Russia's. It's not Russia's and Ukraine's. It, it's an international sea. I mean, oil coming out of out of Russian ports is not just Russian oil. It's it's Kazakhstan. It's Central Asian countries. You even have China involved. I'm saying China has a huge footprint in the Black Sea because of their rail lines that go that way. They can't come out of Russia anymore, so they're coming through there. And this is and a again, food issue. It it's is not a food just. Issue. It's not you know they, part of this. My top three because people are going to do it is. It's protecting the world against famine, right? It's, it's, if the Navy can't send destroyers, how else are we protecting those food shipments? Because not enough is getting out of Turkey. And we've all clapped and said, yay, and the UN's doing this great job. 
that the ships aren't getting sufficient protection so the insurance aren't fully insuring them so the size of the ship i mean we could spend hours on this sal but it's it's really people are going to die because of this there yep. there people are dying right now from hunger because of this and the navy's being very quiet about it. is it the navy's responsibility no but at least take that leadership and find out whose responsibility it is and get them in the news the u.s navy is the forefront of the leadership team on this, we have the United Nations here in the US, we have the NATO naval arm in Norfolk, we have the Pentagon report team. If the CNO and the SECNAV says something, things will happen, but if they stay quiet, people are gonna starve, and, and that's my opinion. I, I think we forget the 80s where, I mean, when, when Iraq and Iran went to war in the Persian Gulf, uh, you know, the US Navy upped its ante in, in the Persian Gulf. It yeah. became a larger presence there. We built the Fifth Fleet. That eventually matured after and the our friend Admiral wars. Stravita says it came out with a plan, uh, yep. you know, and the Navy ignored his plan, too, and didn't give it any. Well, and, and you can't time. tell me it's 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 because it's the argument we get pushed back on all the time. Well, it's provocative. You're, you're putting you know, you're putting sailors in harm's way. Well, I, first off, I think in harm's way is something that the Navy talks about all the time. Then, you, you know, this is a freedom of navigation exercise. The Russians don't friggin own the Black Sea. They own 12 miles out from the high water mark. That's it. That's what they own. The rest of the Black Sea is international seaways. And this should be what the argument is. If you're not doing what Bruce Jones talks about, that, you know, to rule the waves, to create not just U.S. control of the world oceans, but to make the world's oceans an open conduit for trade, which is, has become and has created the greatest growth in economic wealth in the history of the world then you you are basically telling russia not only can they attack ukraine but then they can basically control waterways and if they could do it in the black sea then what's going to stop them from doing it in the baltic what's going to stop them from doing it in the pacific what's going to stop them from doing it in the arctic and I, I i think they're just abrogating and you can't tell me the us navy's not there because i look at the aerial patrols they're sending aerial drones over the black sea every day so the us is there they're off you they're in poland they're in romania they're in bulgaria you know, and again, if you don't want U.S., that's fine. This is pure NATO then. NATO has agreements with three countries on those borders of the Black Sea. They've got, you know, tentative agreements with Georgia. There, there are issues here that they should be in there. And this, that's my concern a lot. Is, and the, is, the NATO's interested. NATO invited me down to Norfolk to, uh, to listen in on some of these discussions. And it was eye-opening, but there was, you know, there was, there was very little... Um, you know, Navy senior involvement in in this issue. And, well, it, uh, and it makes you wonder what kind of message does this give to Putin and others about this, you know, or what does it get? You know, we keep talking about messaging. What, what's the messaging that uh, Chairman Xi is getting from China about this? Will the U.S. Navy back off? Should there be an what's the deterrence? And they yep. talked about the deterrence, but there's also a logistical deterrence, you know, not to pad you too much on the back there sal but you were the very first person in the in the world to writing for a major organization I don't know that about said, the world, but i appreciate it it is that this is a legitimate threat um uh tim snyder at yale said that that in his in his very popular class on the ukraine said only a few people who are real Ukrainian experts like himself and some random, a little bit, he, he did he call you boring? A little bit so. boring <laughs> transportation logistics guys got this right. And that was you and, and I followed up quickly after and then some others, but saying, you know, and I was looking at it, Russia was moving in the beans and the bullets and the thing. Yep. If it was just an exercise, why are they moving that? But also he, he sat there for weeks while our preposition ships did not move from Diego Garcia, you know, if those ships had moved, they don't even have to enter the Black Sea. If we had moved the carriers from the Eastern Med to the, uh, from the Western Med to the Eastern Med, if we had moved in those logistics ships, if we started activating Marad ships, um, logistics plays a role in deterrence as well. And that's been completely forgotten. Well, we, we see that Representative Gallagher from Wisconsin has been talking about that, what kind of deterrence was being done. And, you know, I remember reading Colin Powell's autobiography and talking about how the fact back in 1990 to deter Saddam Hussein, we did almost nothing to deter him. Matter of fact, we gave, gave him the kind of the go ahead. We could have been moving forces that would have indicated to him 
that, you know, it's better to move the forces and not use them than to have to sit there and do nothing and then have to fix it afterwards. And, and that's one of the things you want to do. But again, we didn't do it. Matter of fact, we have lessened the deterrence in Europe. We decreased our presence in Europe. We removed the prepositioning squadron that was based there in the Mediterranean. And we basically said, hey, Europe is fine. We can't envision this happening. And we've increased our reliance on the aviation aspects with Transcom and putting all this money in aviation. And aviation just... It, it's great. It's great for quick response, but you can fight a peer to peer power quickly. You need that overwhelming support. And that's one of the things I said at the NATO conference to the head of the ESG uh, at, at the Pentagon. She was talking about how they're going to improve aircraft efficiency in their fleet by, you know, up to 5%, which will, I mean, it, Air Force has the biggest fuel bill of any organization in the world. And I'm, this is an anti-Air Force. But if you want ESG, if you want movement of goods, it's got to go on ships. But we don't do that. We wait to the last minute and put it on an airplane. And it's hurting the environment. It's killing our budgets. It's extremely expensive. We're a little prior planning and getting these things out there uh, would save the taxpayer money, would save the environment. And it's a win-win. But... We don't have we don't have capacity in our shipyard <laughs> you uh you and i get into it all the time when people will sit there and say you can put a, a an m1 tank on a c5 or a c17 and fly it in it's like yeah okay that's great now what about the other ten thousand vehicles in the brigade that have to go and all the food and all the supplies and all the fuel and everything warship cam uh on on, on twitter just posted their number they're gonna do in their top five images for the year i think number five was one i posted from one of the LMSRs loading in San Diego. And it, you just see the lay down there of how much gear can go on a single yeah. U.S. supply ship. And it gives you the impression, you know, it gives you, I mean, it's a deterrence. And because that was a big, huge story at the time. One, everybody one Maersk megaship yep. can carry more cargo than the entire U.S. Air Force's lifting fleet. And I believe that includes all of the commercial contractors yep. as well when they bring in FedEx and the UPSs. I mean, it is. And then I think it's a you, huge, it's less than one container on a, on a huge cargo plane. And, and I think the Black Sea is, is, is a perfect one to talk about there with it, John. All right. My number three, I'll give you my number three story is not going to be a surprise to many people who listen to me. And it deals with the Jones Act. So uh, the amount of, of press and stories that have been out there this past year regarding the Jones Act. Everything from waivers down in Puerto Rico uh, because of the hurricane with diesel and LNG to the yearly, yearly call for a waiver for the Jones Act to bring nat uh, natural gas up into New England to uh, provide there. And, and again, I, I think one of the things that I'm seeing right now is, is again, this kind of concentrated calls for repeal and waivers are much more consistent than than I've seen in the past. And, and they're really coming at, at, at a huge volume right now, including trying to undermine the national security element of the Jones Act. Now, everybody knows who has ever watched me that I'll, I'll talk about the Jones Act in a second. And it's something that John does not like to talk about. And this is the one time I can make John quiet is talking about the Jones Act because he hates talking about the third rail of, of the maritime industry in the United States, at least. But I think I think there's time for a sincere and actual discussion about reforming this. I mean, there really needs to be this level. I think, you know, we got reform of ocean shipping through the Ocean Shipping Reform Act, and there's a lot of debate about whether what that does and what it doesn't do. But I think we need to have this discussion. We were talking about the uh, the ship being built in Philly, the National Maritime, uh, excuse me, National Security Multi-Mission Vessel. There's a lot of issues with that vessel because a lot of the components were coming from overseas, from Korea. And, and, and But that's the way ships are built today. Shipyards are fabric. They're basically assembly points. You bring all the material in and you build them together like Lego blocks. And I think we need to be having that discussion. You know, is the steel being built in the United States? Because there's steel provisions. What percentage of steel has to go into a U.S. build vessels? What percentage of the machinery and the components? We need to have an actual rational discussion about it. And this is where I fault leadership at the Maritime Administration. I'm not picking on Admiral Phillips. She just came in. But I'm talking about historically over the years, we need to empower a maritime administrator who can ha make decisions. There have been past maritime administrators you and I have liked. There's been past maritime administrators you and I hated. And I, I think one of the problems has been that bureaucracy. You talked about the bureaucracy of Nav Air. I'll talk about the bureaucracy of, of Marad. There's a lot of bureaucracy in Marriott. It's really hard to get things done in the Maritime Administration. We need to be more flexible, 
more efficient. You're seeing that now with the construction of five vessels for the state maritime academies. That's a great idea. That concept and the, the, the development they're doing in that, get an outside contractor to oversee the building, let them make the contract with the shipyard, and then we get them out to the state schools. That's a, pro a program we should be embracing. You know, I, I think there's a lot of hesitance to build in the United States for obvious reasons. It's expensive. It, it, it's real expensive. But when you look below the surface, you see the same problems in Korea. One of the th tropes I'll hear all the time is Korean shipyard workers make as much as U.S. shipyard workers. But the Koreans do the same exact thing that U.S. shipyards do. They're ones who work full time, get great money, but they don't do that. They pay casuals. They pay part timers. They pay subcontractors. And they pay them. And matter of fact, they're bringing in foreign workers. Big problem in Korea right now is they're bringing a lot of foreign workers in to work in their shipyards. And I think we need to have this discussion. We need there are elements of the Jones Act that are outdated and need to be fixed. At the same time, I would argue that one of the things you see is there needs to be some provisions that remain. I still think the U.S. build requirement is a big one. You know, they always want to compare it to the airline industry. Well, there's two big airline air, airline constructors in the world. There's Boeing and Airbus. That's it. You know, you know, when you control 91 percent of all the aircraft manufacturing in the world, you can have a duopoly. You can compare ma car manufacturers, but car manufacturers are, you know, the, the cars are built all over the place now. And it's really hard to sit there and you still have a large domestic car base in the United States. Also, every American has a car, so it, it's a little different than ships. But I think we need to have that discussion. We need to be able to talk about this. And one of the things I would love to see is someone step up with authority who can facilitate this hearing. It shouldn't be just the shipbuilders. It shouldn't just be the ship operators. It should be the ones who are booking cargo. You know, I'd love to see the freight forwarders involved. I'd love to see the big box stores involved. I'd like to see local chambers of commerce involved. You know, what, what would be the best solution? You know, the focus tends to be the impact this has on Hawaii, Puerto Rico, Alaska. But let's be clear, Hawaii is finds itself in a difficult position no matter what. Being on an island in the middle of the Pacific, it's going to be expensive to live there. I just I hate to say it. It always is. And when you only have a million people on the island, it you're not going to get the big box boats coming in and dropping off cargo like they think is going to happen. And if they do come in, they will monopolize it. Companies like Costco will come in and underbid everybody to get their foothold into those places. But I think we need to have a rational discussion about it. Keeping it the way it is, is not working. Is it the cause for the decline of the Merchant Marine? No. Other nations don't have a Jones Act and they've declined. Britain, France, Germany, the Netherlands, Italy, they've all declined. It's not the Jones Act. At the same time, repeal doesn't create rainbows and unicorns and all of a sudden traffic will ease on I-95 because you've repealed the Jones Act and everything works better in New England because now you're bringing in foreign gas. There are other issues at play here, and I think we just need to have a rational discussion about it. That's my tirade. Sorry, John. That was the number three was going to be my big one. So, no comment. <laughs> I knew, I knew you were going to comment on this one. It was the one I knew I, I could I, say. I, well, you know, and I, it's just because it's a minefield. No matter where you step, it is a minefield. If you try to to alter, or change anything, or come up with a new idea, some element is going to uh, explode on you. And I, after fifteen years of writing about. Uh, you know, foreign for G captain, there, there's no win in any G captain type article or response. But I will say, you said that, uh, you know, you're not going to get on uh, the maritime administrator's uh, case, Commandant Ann Phillips. Uh, she's not only our administrator, she is Commandant of the US Maritime Service. Uh, you know, it, she had problems in her, uh, in her uh, testimony, uh, because she would not you know, say that, give a response to Senator Ted Cruz about the LNG terminal build policy. Uh, she, she would not give what he believed to be a clear response. And you can go on YouTube and view that. But now we have an energy crisis. I mean, we have an energy crisis, a European energy crisis, a, a global energy crisis. We have a food crisis. We have a, a port and logistics supply chain crisis. We have a finance crisis. All of these tie back to ships. And no one, you know, the Federal Reserve is trying to ramp up rates because they're like, well, no matter, we've ramped up rates already and inflation keeps happening. Well, if you can't move goods, it's expensive. And if you can't repair ship and build ship in China, where, and you can't build it anywhere else, where's this relief going to come from? Um, you know, Ann Phillips said her, her 
her guiding star, she said repeatedly, is safety. And we've talked about that, that, that the Coast Guard's in charge of safety and OSHA terminals and stuff. It's not necessarily the Marad's job, but what 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 is she what what has she said to support? She's given a, a very scripted, very prepared statements to Congress. I believe twice she's been in front of Congress. Yeah, I, I don't see her on TV. I don't see her on this YouTube channel. She's certainly not reaching out to G Captain and submitting editorials. Uh, you go to Marad's page. There's nothing written by her. I, I mean, I I get a lot of reports that she's inside the proverbial smoke filled rooms of the maritime industry talking to the same players through the, the K&L Gates and the other law firms that are around. She's talking to the lobbyists, but um, is that, I, I would love to give her the benefit of a doubt, but without anything going out there and saying anything publicly that we can print, uh, I, I just, I don't know what, I don't know how to, to defend her to say anything good. And this was the issue you know, GCAM ran into a lot of trouble because when Trump came in and started coming up with all of these new policies and Admiral Busby came up with all the news, new policies, some of the policies had holes and I was critical in editorials and others were editorial. And the Republicans said, well, you weren't critical of Obama's maritime policies. You didn't write anything about Re Obama's. Well, what, what, what if nothing they? happens, there's <laughs> nothing to write about. Absolutely zero got done. <laughs> In the Obama administration at Marad, and you know, we're we're it feels like we're back to that. We had Busby going out. He was at, it didn't start like that. We were very critical of Busby yep. initial on. I wrote an article. He picked up the phone, called me, invited me down to Washington. I said, You have to be out there in front of the Mariners. You have to get on the YouTube channels. You have to public comment publicly. And then great things were done to getting funding for the national security maritime vessel. And he didn't meet all his, his the things he wanted to do, but you can't do it alone. Marad's got to bring in those, the mariners and the shipyards and the publishers and the media. You got to bring them in and bring them to your side because building a ship is difficult. Changing laws is difficult. And I, how do you do that if you're... I, I mean, I call her the, the, what's the maritime ghost, the flying Dutchman. It's a Mara, it's like the flying Dutchman. You never see him or hear from him until something goes really wrong. <laughs> and there's a I, rumor they were involved. I no, can't no, write I, anything about her. No, I think you're right. And, and you know, I've, I've been critical. And again, you know, I'm sure Admiral Phillips is very capable in what she does in, in her skills. You don't have to be an Admiral I have nothing bad to say about her. I just had nothing good to say because I, there's nothing to say because no. I, where, where's her, where is she? I, you listen, there are a couple of things that Marad does, and again, that they should be doing. I, I mean, obviously, you talked about the LNG facilities. That's a year-long process. It's been over a year. How long does it take to approve this? You just had a story about Germany fast-pacing these the LNG giant facilities. The crisis. Yeah. And, and she they, had a major issue with Ted Cruz will come out yeah. and say, either I was right and we're doubling down or I was wrong. Or yeah. we, and where's Ted Cruz coming in and following up on this? We need these LNG terminals, Sal. This is a major, yep. major issue. And Marai pushes it on the DOE and the DOE takes it. And Especially when you see the Freeport facility being shut down for as long as it has been. It's been an issue. And then in that second uh, uh, testimony, I think it was uh, Senator Whitmer, asked her, you know, okay, what's your wish list? If you were, you know, what, what, what is it that we can fund? Or as one of the senators asked her that, and let me be clear, if, if I'm married and I'm administrator and you ask me what I want, I have a list ready for you. And if I don't have that answer available right then, it's like my staff will get right back to you with my list of 20 things yes, I want to do and staff and let's go. And, and, and that's the kind of stuff you need to be doing. Again, the mission As the, the FMC did, the, the Congress last year asked the oh. FMC the same thing. And the FMC commissioner came out and said, this is a list of things we need. Yep. They got the funding and now they're on the biggest expansion in 50 yep. years. Oh, and they're asking for more too. It's like, listen, we were a little, you know, we, 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 we and should have You can follow what more. they're asking for and what yep. they're doing and everything else, but they're asking, Merit is not asking. Yep. And this NAV C, the Navy doesn't realize the importance of Merit into this. Everyone yep. blames the Navy for the shipyard crisis. It's not the Navy's job to subsidize and support shipyards. Yep. They're the customer. It's a conflict of interest that's the navy but the cno and the second half for some reason takes all of the blame and pushes none on marad and yep. uh, you know i want marad to do better and i i pray they're doing good work but i 
I you, can't listen, you, on my, and let's be clear. You and I know a lot of the people, flying Dutchman. A lot of you, you, we know a lot of people in merit. I worked with a lot of people, you know, them, and they're great people. They really are, but it's the system. It's the con construct in the system. That's the problem. They're completely underfunded and underpaid. But then when yeah. Congress asks, what do you want? That's I, the solution. Yeah. <laughs> you need that funding. You need more people. Well, and, and you know, they, they haven't published any data on shipyards. since like 2006. Jump, they haven't published. They haven't and done I an annual report. I talked to the head of the data. They haven't done an like, 2013. It's, it's been pushed into another department. He's got like nine guys for doing not only data, but a million other things. And there just isn't time. You, you need people. You need a, no. you need a full time. There should be, if NAV C has 80,000 people, there should be 80 people working yeah. in, on, on shipyard data yeah. at Marat. And, and there it doesn't need to be another GS-15 position. You're lucky if there's, I don't think there's eight. No, and it doesn't need to be another GS-15, SES position. What they need is staff. They need staff to go in and recruiting staff from maritime colleges and universities and putting that data, like I said, they haven't done an annual report since 2013. I'm a historian. I live on annual reports and data being put out by these entities. And when you don't have anything put out in almost a decade from the United States Maritime you know, Administration, that's a problem. It, it, it's hard. You know, when your mission, and I, I pull their mission right from their website all the time. And they haven't promote... done a, I forget what it's called, but the shipyard, uh, you know, where they actually go to the shipyards. That's been even longer, Sam. Yeah. And, you know, when your mission is to promote the maritime industry, then promote it. That's your job. And they get dinged for that. I understand there are people who are out there ding them for that, but they don't do that job. And, and it's like, to me, this, oh, this people, is one of people the... People attack maritime all, all, all the time, maritime this, all the time. And this but is it's why... like Homer Simpson, uh, you know, in that episode where he's the boxer because he can take the punches. That's I, that's what Barrett can take the punches. They, they can. And, 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 and the problem is when they don't speak, the, the only voices that are out there are those in opposition. And that's, that's been my problem for a long time. All right, we, we can talk about this. And one you would think the Navy would see and the 80,000 people at AMC would see what... I, I mean, can you believe that Marad is actually on budget on schedule for this, the training ship and Philly Acre? <laughs> and I can't, I can't understand how this is all bad about Marad. I'm not criticizing Marad. We need more Marad. It just, and, and how does the Navy, by the way, again, you're going to get me going on my history here in a minute, but the way the Navy built ships for a long time was a lot of the ships came from Marad. They came from the Maritime Commission. They built ships, you know, when you needed an auxiliary vessel, when you needed something, you went to Marad, you went to the Maritime Commission, you had them build it for you because listen, we're going to focus on warships. We're not going to build these things. Why they don't do that now, I have no idea. Why these national security multi-mission vessels are not being converted or the, the, the whole form being used for a new hospital ship, which don't get me going on hospital ships, you know, is, is, is another thing, you know, because maybe then we can put a platform on that could, I don't know, get patients up into the vessel without dropping them in the water. I don't know. Maybe these are things that we should be looking at. And, and again, they're not. And it just, ugh. Okay, we're going to go to story number two, because I even got you talking about this, so I, which I was amazed at. So I, I'm just shocked by that. All right, John, your story number two. We're getting in the story top. number two is, uh, you know, we had a uh, American pilot refused to support a Russian ship. Uh, and, and that was, I think, our top five or yeah. number six article of the entire year for G Captain last year. An American pilot said from a major American port, I, I'm not boarding any Russian ships. I'm not going to take a Russian, and there was just an outpouring of, of support. There's been an outpouring of support uh, for the seizure of the super yachts and for the uh, Russian sanctions on the oil. Uh, it's very hard to find someone who's against these policies. Uh, they, they shut down. I mean, it's one of Biden's most popular things coming down and saying that we're really going to clamp down on the economics. People were very uh, wary when that came out, including myself. Is this going to work? But he really, you know, screwed into it um but again the focus hasn't been on the maritime sector it kind of has to be because the oil is transported and especially after nord stream which by the way was attacked in the water it's a maritime story uh this stuff has to come on ships so it kind of is but then you have greece at every single turn the the greek ship owners are fighting this tooth and nail and putting the, the you know uh the, the wrench in the gears uh, with these sanction plans. And then you have Turkey with the introduction of uh, Sweden and Finland and some of these transportation issues. And, um, you know, so, so sanctions and it's, they're really making it more complicated. <laughs> you know, if, 
if you supported Putin and you support the war and everything else, we're taking your yacht where your ship doesn't come in. That's that's how it started. And now it's like, well, if you go into these areas and if you sell for above this price and if you self-insure, then you can come into these ports and that ports. This complexity is allowing Russia to 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 sell its oil and sell other products and um you know that there's this huge public support for simple solutions like one pilot standing up and saying i'm not taking russian ships uh but then the government bogs it down with these complex sanction programs that are now you know thousands upon thousands of lawyers are working on and compliance teams and shipping companies are putting in millions of dollars and it's going to take time to see if they even work maybe that's what has to happen i don't know i'm not judging either way i'm just saying this is the number two story of the year i i think the self-sanction story is a, is a great one because i'd expand it even more i know the story you had with the pilots was great because i thought that was really americans standing up at that moment there and and really everyone realized all of a sudden the essential nature of pilots if you don't have the pilots you're not bringing ships in but you know when the container line started sanctioning russia i mean you saw the power i mean there was power beyond state control that really influenced things. We saw it with Maersk and Hop Hog and a lot of the big shipping companies all of a sudden sit there and say, hey, we're shutting down our operations in Russia. We're, we're gonna phase them out. Now it took them a while and there was a big, I would I question some of the phase down because it took them a long time for them to kind of cut out their operations. But you definitely saw the role that maritime industry can play in, in self-sanctioning in, in some areas. And on the flip side, as you mentioned, at the same time, there are other groups that sat there and said, hey, we're grease tankers. We're going to keep flowing Russian oil, you know, and, and you know, when you look at the, the meaning of the of the Greek uh, ship owners at uh, Poseidon uh, this past year and you hear them come out, you know, listen, we're going to keep hauling Russian oil because that's our bread and butter. You can see the difference. Huge there. parties, right? Huge oh, parties. Man. I mean, everyone's benefiting from this. So, I mean, there, there was actually a rave at Poseidon. And yeah, it, it, well, and you, this is the industry. You know, one of the big things, you know, I'm going to be talking to Jay Mintzmeyer later on. And, you know, one of the things we're going to talk about is his year in review and, and also his, you know, what he sees going forward. And tankers, you know, tankers have the potential to be what container ships were here uh, because of the ton miles, because of the distances involved. You know, the energy issue is a big one. And, and, I, I think, you know, those self-sanctions are and really bulkers important. with the movement of coal. Uh, look oh, at yeah. the profit of the coal companies. Yeah. And it, it's it, not local. They, they are two types. The coal companies that are local and sell locally are, aren't doing, they're doing a little bit well this year, but the ones yeah. that are selling internationally, oh, yeah. uh, the Glencores of the world uh, who are trading them, uh, huge profits. Yeah. And, and I, I think it's a great one because, again, you see, again, the power of these companies and the, and the powers that they have and these essential elements within the maritime infrastructure. When you can get pilots on board, when you get shipping companies doing this, this this has the power to move politics, move national policy in some ways. And I, I think it's really important to highlight that. And I think I think the pilot story was a great one for that. All right. Uh, my number two story goes to the port of L.A. and the supply chain crisis. And to me, the Port of L.A., and I, I don't mean to bash on the Port of L.A. I never do. I, let me be clear. The Port of L.A. did magnificent work during the entire supply chain crisis. The, the longshoremen, stevedores, the crews there, the train, the, 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 the dredge, you know, we kept the supply chain moving. And, and they did a fantastic job in keeping everything moving. I, I think, again, the unheralded role should go to the supply chain people that never took the days off. They, they didn't work from home. They could not, you know, virtually do this stuff. They had to be there. And some died as a result because being exposed to COVID. And I think that's, that's that was a huge element. My criticism with L.A., has to do with the fact that we focus so much attention on LA that it became really the focal point of the supply chain crisis. And I think it highlighted, again, a lot of the issues that we had as a nation, you know, the fact that ports are locally controlled, they're not, you know, federal, they're not, you know, they're not under a federal policy, really. And, and the fact that LA sat there and, and really did not heed the lessons that they should have done. You know, I did a video way back when on a report done by the FMC in 2015 that highlighted all the problems that LA and every other American port had during the supply chain crisis that we were not ready for. And they came to fruition. Whereas ports like Long Beach, right next door, 
basically took some initiative. They improved their railway uh, system. They built the LBCT terminal, much more automated system. And LA did. The Trey Pack facility became much more automated, much better. But at the same time, it didn't. And, you know, we had that issue with, with LA where LA was the backlog. It was the huge backlog off the ports. And what we were missing there and what we weren't getting from the port of LA was an accurate assessment of other issues that are at play here. The rail issue, the infrastructure issue, the yard issue, the automation, the ability to drive your truck in and get your container in and out of the terminal in a reasonable amount of time. And what we're seeing now is ports like Houston, Savannah, and New York, New Jersey are being efficient. They, you know, New York, New Jersey is a, is a hamstrung port. It is hemmed in by Newark. I mean, there's no room for growth. You can't grow New York, New Jersey terminal anymore. Yet they are now the largest port in the United States. They're moving efficiently. They came well, up we, with- We just bring in a fleet of American flag dredgers and we can create land, right? That's what, that's what well, Singapore is doing. And, and that, that, that's the other issue too, is, is, is where is that, and I'll go back to the Maritime Administration, where is that port infrastructure plan that should be developed. I mean, Marriott well, is- That's the issue you've you've seen, you know, what, what worked in LA is you've seen this in mass media attention and the focus on it. And you had uh, Gene uh, Soroka and you had uh, Mario at Long Beach and you had Marty Walsh, the, the labor uh, secretary and you had Pete Buttigieg, transportation secretary and they all came in and they focused on this and the New York Times wrote articles and CNN focused it. And General Lyons became the- uh, but the supply chain czar yep, and have the direct ear of Washington. But then these other parts fall apart. Why? Because it's not either of those people's jobs to do this. If only we had a, a department equivalent to the, you know, the FAA takes care of planes and airports. Only if we had an FAA that was in charge of ports. Oh, wait a second. That's Marad, Maritime Administration. Right. How, in all of those interviews for over a year, for months, how many times did you see the Flying Dutchman uh, on the TV there? Yeah, I didn't see anybody from Marriott. Did they and, even and, show up? I mean, I, so so you have, but so if you try to legislate or something through the D Department of Labor or through the White, try to shove it through in the White House, or you try the Department of even Transportation, which houses Marriott, they don't have the legislative ability to do this. You can't have the New York train or uh, subway system messing with the airports, <laughs> okay? But yet that's what we're trying to do in the Maritime Administration. Everyone's trying to all hands on deck to fix this problem, but none of them have the the legal authority to do so. Marad does, but no one wants to talk to Marad right. because it, they keep failing, but they keep failing because they're underfunded. And then Congress asks, what do you want? But in the congressional testimony did they, with Marad, did they even bring up the LA? I mean, this isn't even on like our top... Our, our most concerned and our best congressmen aren't even aware that hey, this is a shipbuilding is not failure of subsidy is not a Navy issue. It's a merit issue. This LA thing is, is a merit issue. This European energy crisis, not being able to get enough LNG. That's a maritime merit issue. Yep. No. And, and let me be clear. I, I don't now think you got me ranting. So no, well, let me be clear. I, I don't think the, the end all solution is, is federal government. Let's be clear about this. You know, I was down in Florida recently. And one of the things we saw is the state of Florida sat there and said, listen, come to Florida. You know, Texas, Texas said, come to Texas. And we know what we saw was a shift. We saw people leave. But these LA. other government agencies are acting and they yes, don't have they are. the legal authority to. And they are not representative of the people. The people did not vote for the Labor Department to get its hands in dirty in, in L.A. They didn't yep. vote for Obama to put Marty Walsh in. They didn't. No one voted for a, a port czar in the White House. We're glad they're in there. But. Well, and, and again, you know, when you have, again, for L.A., when you have this labor issue with the ILWU. I don't and want PMA, more government. I just want the government that's tasked with it to do it instead yeah. of a million government entities all trying to do the same yeah. thing. Well, and and, none of them having the legal clout to do it. And, and when you have the ILWU PMA with this, you know, 
you know, they can sit there and say they're not going to strike, but as after June 30th, they have the option to strike. And as long as that option's there, it's going to cause problems. When Union Pacific has issues with the rail lines, when, when you can't get automation so you can get drayage in there, when California passes AB5 and new emission standards that are going to force 20% of the tra drayage trucks to not go to the port of LA and Long Beach anymore because they don't meet emission standards, that's going to drive people out. And, you know, what it does is it pushes it to the East Coast and the Gulf Coast. And that's exactly what we're seeing. And you see ports in Texas, in Florida, in Savannah, in Charleston, in Norfolk, in in uh, uh, Boston, in New York, New Jersey. Our friend Beth Rooney. I mean, look what she's doing in New York, New Jersey. She she instituted she instituted a a a uh, system there where if you leave your container on the terminal a certain amount of time, you're going to get fined. But it's not like the L.A. one that was just first off illegal as crap there is no way they were going to do that but it was actually made sense and and what they're doing is you know hey it's longer than new york new jersey it's going to cost me more to get to new york new jersey from east asia but i'd rather pay a little bit extra that's to what's know most that frustrating is the solutions are here you want you want to know how <laughs> to do repair work go to alabama shipyard you want yep. to know how to build new ships Go to Philly Acre, talk to Mara. Do you want to know hey, how to solve the container crisis? Go talk to Beth Ann Rooney and New York BA. And but there's no the federal entity bringing all this yep. together. And Beth's wonderful. I think she's doing amazing work in New York, but she's got her hands full there. She can't go to Savannah and help them out in Florida and come up with a plan in Seattle, Tacoma. That's I, I, Mara's job is to take the best in the country and share that with the other organizations. I was just down in Florida at an event where I gave a talk and it was it was sponsored by the Secretary of Commerce now or Deputy Secretary of Commerce down there for Florida. And they had a, I gave a talk on the supply chain crisis, but then they had a panel. And on that panel was the captain of uh, or the head of the Pilots Association for Jacksonville. You had local uh, trucking, you had the airports, uh, you had uh, the rail, uh, you had a, you know, all the elements of transportation were right there on a panel. And who was listening to them was the people who would use them, the, the you know, the, the, the major shippers, the, the cargo consignees, everyone who hit them. And so what they heard was a panel that talked about the entire intermodal process, you know, from landing the ship to offloading the ship in the port, in Jack's port, to trucks, to rails, to air. Every element was right there. And what it did is exposed everyone to, okay, we need all these elements to work together to be efficient. And when you hear that in Northern Florida, that tells people, listen, okay, I'm gonna go to Northern Florida because they understand this. You, you, and this is what the federal government should be doing on a national basis, in a regional basis, hosting these type of events to be able to coordinate this and sit there and say, okay, what's the problem? What can we do to facilitate? I don't want to throw money at the problem because that, that's never the solution. What I want to do is facilitate this. Do the job you're supposed to do. I want to and, throw money at Merritt. Well, I, I, the, my problem with throwing money at the Merritt is it's not going to go to where I think it needs to go right now. You got to fix the Merritt. You got to fix that's the situation. That's the government though, Sal. I know, I know, I know. I'm, I'm living in under my rose-colored glasses here. All right, John, we come to our number one story. We've been on a good tirade here, you and I. So we come to the biggest story for the past year. What's your number one story? The number one story of the year, by by far, hands and away, I, I believe it's not even a close race uh, at all, is uh, deglobalization led by shipping. Um, we had uh, Peter Zian, um, who I've reviewed his book, uh, The End of the World is Just the Beginning. And I know you have issues uh, with him because, you know, for uh, I, American I just readers, had one, one issue with Peter when he talked about the Jones. I thought he may have just a couple of issues with, with that. But I, I, I love Peter. I, I think what he talks about is pretty accurate most of the time. Peter's a great general. I don't think everything he, he yeah. says is right and everything, all his predictions are right either. But, right. You know, and he does, he tends to make these outlandish predictions. And the number one uh, story of the year is not Peter Zian. It's yeah. the globalization that, that he really outlined um, six or eight years ago with his first book. But his broad premise is that the number one a uh, thing that has lifted more invention, lifted more people out of poverty than any other invention in the history of humanity is the shipping container. And the shipping container is uh, requires global 
security, global security at the seas. And you look back after World War II, the Bretton Woods Agreement, and that the Navy says we are going to defend the seas and bringing the global community in together. There are other elements of it, opening up our, our markets, the using the dollar, and you know, there's a lot involved here, but movement, vast amounts of movement of goods via ships is environmentally sound. It is economically sound. It pulls people out of poverty. It prevents hunger. It prevents freezing in the winter when uh, a peer invades Ukraine and you got to move energy. This, our quality of life is dependent on this and it's quickly falling apart, first with, with Russia and now with, with China's uh, absolute crazy COVID policies of complete lockdown followed by now. Now they're just opening up and and, and letting people get sick and there are going to be millions dead. But people don't realize the, the corner of this is ships. And in order for ships to operate, and I talk about it with the, I, I was at the ASBA conference in um, uh, uh, American Society of... Um, Port agents, and um, they. I was talking about Zian's book, and um, you know there, there was some pushback from some of the Europeans saying, you know, uh, America has kind of given up their um, crown in the maritime domain, and you're not as important as you once were. And yes, and yes, and yes, and yes, and there are reasons, and the reasons that Zian. I mean, its thick book goes into this about how we pushed this agreement and no one wanted to accept it at first. We could only push this agreement on the two countries who were forced to, Germany and Japan. And then the other European countries looked at the huge economic success of, of uh, Germany and Japan, followed by Korea, um, and said, we want in too. But they all had uh, their, you know, we, we made agreements with them. And one of our agreements was with the UK. The UK said, you can't be the policemen and the truck drivers of the world. You know, so let us control the maritime and let the European and give up some of your US flag. And, uh, and you can continue to have the strongest Navy and the platform. So, you know, going back to the Jones Act is is the destruction of the U.S. maritime, is it being protected by the Jones Act or is the Jones Act hurting it? I don't know that, but has it been dismantled, the U.S. merchant marine dismantled by negligence, uh, Abandoned Oceans is a wonderful book on that, or has it been systematically dismantled, not by this conspiracy theory room, but for real purposes that are rational purposes that are outlined in Peter Zeehan's book. And now as that system, which has been good, Zeehan's a, a huge proponent of globalization. Um, he's a huge, ginormous proponent of short sea shipping and the things that the Jones Act wants to protect and moving freight off of the airline and off of trucks onto the waterway system. He thinks it is our greatest natural gift more than our resources is our waterway system. He wants to use that. But, you know, we're, we're Apple's closing factories in China, Sal. They were the last ones. This has already happened. Near sourcing, friend sourcing. It's all being talked about. New money. The, the stock market is on a crash as we, we look at how this is going to be organized. But no one talks about it in the New York Times, the Financial Times, anything else, that this is all predicated on the movement of tonnage, large, heavy stuff on ships. And that goods needs to be protected. And the U.S. Navy, not even the U.S. Navy realizes how important this is. Zian does. And now Zian's turned in just in a couple last couple of months into this media superstar. Um, but the central premise of his talk is deglobalization is a shipping story and it's a Navy story. And when I talk to the European ship owners, they don't want to talk about the Navy. <laughs> they know nothing about the U.S. Navy. What does the Navy have to do with Maersk? There's no one in Maersk who I've talked to who knows. And Maersk is not visiting Marin. It's Soren, get off your butt. Get on a plane in Copenhagen. 
fly to Marad and meet with Ann Phillips. Zorn's Admiral retired Ann now, Phillips anyway. And the CNO, right? Zorn's retired now. He's he's, 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 he's kicking back. He's kicking back on the beach somewhere. So he, he's not yeah. even going to do that. No, I I I think your story is is a perfect choice. If we don't fix this and all these other problems are going to get bigger is China can't build more ships and we don't have the capacity and the ships have to move around hot spots because of the security, it's going to suck a, a, the little capacity we have and people are going to starve and go hungry and things we need. We need maybe Ann Phillips was right. Maybe safety is the North Star, the safety of merchant ships, but we don't have the ships ourselves. So it has to be the other ships. Yep. No, I, listen, my, my number one builds right on your story. So I'm going to tap into that and we can talk about it is, you know, I talked about Russia, Ukraine, and, and I talked about the, the breakdown of the world order because because I would argue that, you know, post Cold War, the collapse of the Soviet Union ushered in this period where, you know, it, it was Francis Fukuyama talking about the end of history. You know, it was the classic kind of deglobal, you know, uh, uh, you know, end of end of confrontation. The U.S. is a hyperpower. And this is Bruce Jones talking about in the rule of the waves, this idea of pure globalization. And you just looked, mentioned Fukuyama because he retweeted a bunch of your tweets early <laughs> in the Ukrainian war. I saw but, that. Don't think I didn't miss that. But, but, uh, well, let's, you let's had the clear. Yale professor, Tim Snyder on the Stanford, uh, heavyweight. Well, Francis, uh, I, I got issues. I got issues there. with both of them. Let's be clear. I got issues with both of them. But I, I think the issue you have here is, let's be clear, Russia-Ukraine is not the biggest war we've had since the end of the Cold War. I mean, Africans have been killing each other. We've had Asian wars where we've had a lot more people going. But this is the first time we're seeing fighting in Europe on this scale, except for Yugoslavia and the breakup. And this has the, the potential to endanger the, the, the concept of, of these open seas and this, 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 this post-Cold War environment we're living in. And, you know, the, the, the danger is, is things like China with the Belt and Road Initiative is much more not capitalistic. It's not communistic. It's mercantilistic. It, it, it's trying to control your resources, try to control your trade, try to ensure that you have markets for imports and exports. And, you know, this is the thing that post-World War II and post-Cold War, we've been pushing the whole time. This is what Zian talks about. But is, Sal, it, if if you if you if your only tool is a hammer, there's that old proverb. Oh yeah. Every problem's gonna look like a nail. Our only tool, our only successful manufacturing base, you said it, is Boeing. Yeah. We do aviation really well. Uh, but the Raytheon has 120, 140 billion market cap. Yeah. Uh, Boeing's like an 80 billion market do cap. Or well. HII is less than 10 billion. Yeah. Like we do aviation really well, but the problem is we're, we're trying to solve this problem with aviation space. So oh, Elon Musk and SpaceX is going to fix this, but we need ships and we can't build them, right? No, we, we, we need ships. We need freight. We need cargo. I, I mean, this is this is the element that we we tend to forget and our I hammer I have a, is is aircraft and spacecraft but, but we're, we're I, trying to solve this globalization and looking at the maritime issues uh, the nail uh, with the go, hammer go back to what you were talking about the the effort to st i mean the, the danger this has is we're seeing it in the energy sector you just talk about the energy sector for a second if you start sanctioning russia you're talking about lng you're talking about na uh, crude oil you're talking about natural gas you're talking about uh, diesel you can't this, move them on planes <laughs> right and, and and it has the potential to disrupt energy across the globe. And, and we're seeing that. We knew this was going to happen. The minute you start talking about these sanctions, this was going to have the issue. You're going to start hauling oil longer distances. You're going to launder that oil in second countries to turn it into diesel so you can sell it. it means more ton miles. That means the, the, the dwindling pool of tankers out there that nobody's building right now is going to be a big problem. It's one of the reasons why we think the tanker industry is going to see this big uptick come this way same thing with the bulk trade when we talked about the grain shortages coming out of ukraine and russia and coal and, and coal uh, coming out all of this all of this across the board all and this then copper gas. and heavy metals for this what, what, electrification yep. of the highways that Budachek is focusing on instead yep. of using what we already have which is the the water well, right and, and then let's let's add imo in there and their attempt to with esg to get ships to go 50 percent cleaner by 2050 but even then we're going to 2023 with these new cii and exi standards that are there you know you get soren uh, over at maersk talking about the fact that i'm going to need five to fifteen percent more capacity in maersk to handle this because i got to slow ships down you know this 
what we're seeing here is is a restructuring of the world order. And I look at for things like the U.S. Navy. How is the U.S. Navy looking at the economic sanctions on the G7 price cap, for example? We're a member of the G7. We've instituted a price cap. Does anyone in the Navy even know about this or understand this? And, you know, if Russian vessels are they out there. They keep yelling at HII to, to build more ships, but they don't understand the cost of capital with a market capitalization. Yep. That is that is one quarter of the price of Twitter. And I know these are hard words to think. And it took me a year to figure this out and research this. I'm not a math expert, but these are basic financial concepts that no one in the United States was just the Marine Money Conference in New Orleans. And before that, it was at Marine Money Week in New York. And there wasn't a single naval officer in any. How are they going to? How are you to build a ship if you don't understand the basic financial mechanisms to do so, and the basic finances of the movement of goods and these, uh, you know, summit uh, treaties? And and, and and you want to talk about how you know why is it Japan, Navy, Korea, and China? But the be- Navy says we have a new great plane that can shoot a missile, and the, uh, our latest aircraft carrier can do however many sorties a minute and, and there are people who say it's the end of the aircraft carrier i don't believe that i think lean into your strengths but not at uh you know not exclusively but i i think again what we talked about is japan korea and china the reason they're the leading shipbuilders is not because they have a technology that eclipses ours they're using technology we use to build ships Basically, it's it's the funding. It's it's how they finance. It's how they get the money to do this. How do they get control of the cargo? How why are they the ones who and are leadership out there? to cut willing to cut the red tape? Yep. And 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 you know when when things go bad, which they will in the shipping industry, a government willing to step in to provide that net, which is needed at times to shore up an industry. You know when when U.S. lines. If collapse only there was like a title loan program that that's that funded. Well, yeah, yeah, okay. Keep imagine, but in '86 when U.S. lines collapsed, I mean that was the perfect example. Is they let let them go, they let Sealand go to Maersk, and and then you see what happens in the United States. And that was cognizant. Everyone had their eyes wide open at that. There were no blinders on and nobody was talking about it. But I think going back to what you said for your number one story in mine, this deglobalization, this issue about the fact that we're seeing the world's oceans once again become competitive is a big problem because that continually jump in global trade, which we saw forever. I mean, good God, we go from 19. All of the biggest stories of the year from Forbes, the energy crisis, that's a movement of energy. That's a shipping Thing. The financial crisis, raising the rates, they're raising the rates because prices won't go down. Prices won't go down because there's no supply. There's no supply because the ports are clogged and there aren't enough ships. The food crisis, global crisis, that's a shipping. It's, the food's there sitting on the dock in Ukraine. It can't get out. Taiwan, that's an invasion of Taiwan. That's a naval matter. It's an island, <laughs> all right? You you got the, the five and the, the port congestion. You got the five biggest stories of 2022 globally not just uh, not you the gcam and sal top five the the forbes oh, yeah. and new york times top five they're all shipping issues yep and and you know i going forward let's talk about what are looking forward for 2023 is... well very first last year you said that the 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 organization that you are most worried about of the year you said or the, the the biggest thing you're worried about in the next year. Not we weren't that early in predicting Ukraine. Um, you said Marad. I said IMO. Yep. Um, I think I, I think I won that. But you know. I think you um, did. I, I think you're right. But uh, what what is what is your biggest worry? What a single organization is is the one you're watching out well, for in 2023? Well, I think what I'm watching out for is not so much an organization or an entity. It it, it is the role that shipping plays in the public awareness going forward. I mean. We had two years here where shipping was in the forefront. Uh, probably best visibility you've seen with shipping is during the supply chain crisis. You know, and you and I both know it tends to be disasters that bring shipping in the forefront. And how do you contextualize them into something positive? I think right now the issue, as, as you mentioned, is how do you keep shipping in the forefront? How do you keep people's attention focused on the centrality of shipping to the global economy and to people's livelihood at home. You know, because again, we, as much as we talked about onshoring industries- But we had the attention and nothing was done to fund merit. We had, we, what we've been asking for that the world finally wakes up to the importance of shipping, that happened a year ago. And Merit's th- budget did not increase. 
But so, I, I think you and I will both take notice of the fact that is you know, that is news, that going to help? Well, I, I think if if news and other entities are tapping into people who know this, which I think they are now more than they were, and, and we have we have more. a very vocal, we have the most vocal, charismatic uh, transportation secretary in uh, in decades. But well, it, and, he's not talking about ships. No, he's not. And um, you know, I. I Tweeted the other day the concern that you know people are stranded by Southwest and that gets the immediate attention of the Secretary of Transportation, whereas supply chain took weeks, months, if not a year, to get that kind of level of attention. And I, I think we this is my concern is is looking at 2023, those shipping fall out of the venue of attention and fall back into its secondary. So whose fault? Role. I'm, I'm going to make you pin this on someone. Whose fault if it does fall out? Who who are you pinning this on? I think it's I, I think it is political leaders in many ways. It's political leaders in some ways allowing that to fall because they've been really thrust into the importance of this. But I also think it's the entities that again are out there whose job should be to promote this and, and talk about it. And I'm not just going to talk about the maritime administration. I'll talk about maritime colleges and universities that generate people to go out into this industry. It's people within the industry. I'll focus. You and I both had this talk a long time ago, and I've talked to people in every major maritime news outlet, and they share the same thing to me, is that the shipping companies hate to talk. Whenever given happened, everybody clammed up. And nobody wanted who to talk can about force this. them. Who's the one who can? That's, I think, that's one I of think, the reasons I said IMO last year, because IMO has the legal responsibility to provide some leadership. They don't. They, they, there was actually a movie about the IMO, how bad their leadership <sighs> is that came out um, recently. Um, but who, who are you pinning the, I, I'm not going to let you just say the, the nefarious media here. No, no, I'm not, and it's not the media. I, I think it's it's is the industry itself. What entity itself. do we? Who's, I, who's I that think it's all? I think it is the maritime industry as a whole. I think in the United States, again, but it's you know, completely dismantled. I mean, the the container guys don't talk to the tanker guys. Tanker and guys I think don't that's go their, to Navy that is the, that Navy is guys the, don't go to cruise ship conferences. That is the problem. That is the the ultimate problem. They have to do a better job of getting out there. Again, I can point to specific companies where I've tried to get information from and talk to them, they won't talk to you and they won't say anything for fear of saying one word that's going to be used against them in some way. And companies have got to get their head out of that. I, I mean, again, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll fold you a group right off the bat, the World Shipping Council, that is the lobby group for all the large container liners. I'll give you a perfect example. Now, the head of them, Butler, you know, he, he's their, he's the guy, he's their lobbyist to go out. They did a terrible job talking about how important they were during the supply chain crisis. I think they fundamentally fell on their face with that. And I'm sorry to say this, but I'm going to be clear about this. They had a horrible website for a long time. They updated it. They did something new, but they were attacked by the U S Congress because of the issue of them being foreign cruise line of uh, foreign companies. And they never once, in my opinion, sat out there and said, this is the reason that the global economy did not collapse during COVID is because we kept ships moving. We kept the supply chain moving. They did a terrible job at doing that. And that means not just the lobby group talking for them, but their parent companies that support that lobby group do that. And the education that's involved in doing that. You know, I've been a big proponent for talking about educating not just the federal government, but state and local governments on the vital role uh, that Lena shipping Lena Gothberg is going to be excited that you, that that's her issue on the shipping podcast. It's, oh, yeah. it's something I'm passionate about and uh, welcome aboard, Sal. World Shipping Council, everyone. And uh, Sal, mine, mine for this coming year, I would like to say it's the Navy because I think they're critical, but it's such a large organization. It's so, I mean, everyone, when I, I trick everyone, if you see me at a conference, I'll ask you, what's the biggest shipping company in the world? And they'll say Maersk or, or um, CMA or uh, CGM or you MSC. You better say MSC or else, or else uh, no, the Apani family is going to put, put but, that uh, uh, hit out for you. I mean, their, their, their budget and revenue it pales in comparison to what we spend in the Navy. The Navy is the largest oh, yeah. shipping company in the world. So it's too big for me just to say the Navy. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with NAVC. I think the shipbuilding crisis is the biggest crisis here you have 80,000 with 80,000 people and billions hundreds of billions of dollars uh we should be able to solve 
and and examples from from Acre and from uh, Philadelphia Shipyard. I think if NAVC grabbed the CEO of uh, Philly Acre and Alabama and then brought in the Samsungs and brought in Toyota. Toyota, how did you build uh, factories in the U.S.? Uh, you know, uh, well, let's it, let's look at Mitsui and, uh, and Samsung and, what's and team doing them in the Gulf? with. Alabama and Bollinger yeah. and um, but it's got to come from somewhere and I say NAVC is is the organization that has the biggest potential for good or harm over the next year well I and think, everyone I think... says it's moving in the right direction someone just said um, or Hunter Styers a good friend doing amazing work um, yep. he was like man did you see what they Del Toro gave speech at Columbia saying some of the improvements and finally highlighting some of the Merchant Marine. I said, yes, but it's not enough. And Hunter's like, you can't get mad at someone for, I mean, it's the first step. And I say, I'm not mad. I'm happy. I'll take whatever I can get. I'll take what I can get. But he needs to but, put, he needs to put force behind that, that speech. I've, we I've have 80,000 people. They need to pivot now. Yeah. When I was at the Naval Academy, you did the 90 degree pivot. Toro, Tor, Del Toro did the 90 degree pivot. You did the 90 degree pivot. Your plebe year, your mug year at New York Maritime. Yeah. NAVC, great people, great organization, great funding. Del Toro and the head of NAVC, the Admiral in charge, needs that 90 degree pivot from plebe year. If they forget how to do it, give me a call. Yeah. I will put it on video. I still remember how. Hey, uh, Representative Elaine Luria just got voted out of office. She's looking for a job. This is a great one for her to oversee. I, I think there's a lot of people out there who are aware of this. And, and again, one of the things that we know watching this industry is the consolidation. We're seeing it in shipyards. We're seeing, you know, the fact that shipyards are shrinking in numbers. That's worldwide. It's not, it's nothing new. We've been seeing it for a long time. And, you know, this consolidation is a big issue. You know, everyone gets on, you know, Musk for Twitter and everything and controlling things. You know, look at the commercial side, look at the shipping side. And you see that power really being, I just did a video with Lego blocks talking about the power. Built, he could have built, he could have bought Huntington and Ingalls, which builds every type of ship that we have oh, pretty God. much. Navy ship, including the, they're the only ones with big mega air cover gear. He could have bought that for one quarter of the price of Twitter. Oh yeah. And, and, and again, it, it, it's one of those it's a issues. fire sale on the shipyard. Look at the halter Marine. Man, so that, that story is, is again, and those of you who hadn't go take a look at that story. It was amazing. Just the land purchase on that was a steal. It was, it was crazy. That deal, John, we recapped a year. We talked about predictions for the future. It'll be interesting to see a year from now where we're at. And uh, I want to thank you for coming on and spending a good chunk of your time with us. A long video, but it's a lot to recap. And I will be sure to always it's point short people... compared to all the stories we missed because it was oh, yeah. a... I, but I will always be sure to point people over to G Captain, your best source for immediate news and really in-depth reporting. I think G Captain is the best one out there. And John, I appreciate you coming on and talking to us today. I love the show. I'm uh, your biggest fan, Sal. You know that. And uh, I hope everyone hits that subscribe and uh, hits the bell for notifications. There you go. And do the same thing over to GCAP and get their newsletter, which is a daily newsletter. You can get updated all the time by uh, John and Mike Schuller and the rest of the crew over there at GCAP. And so until our next episode, this is John and Sal signing off. John, that was great. I appreciate you doing it. I know we went a little long, but that's fine. Uh, this is a good episode. So we covered a lot of stuff. You were going to get me to talk about someone. You want me to point a finger at somebody there. You pointed at Marad last year. I, I want to see. Who I did point at Marad last year. I was I was pretty vocal at Marad this last year. But I think again, I I, I think that my concern. But this year you gave her a pass. I didn't give her a pass. I, I it was pretty hard on Marad, but I, I do think the big issue is that the maritime subject falls off the headlines, and I think that's a big no, issue. No, that's, that's good. That's, World Shipping Council. I think I, that's, I think that's good. Doing. And and I well, I think they're they're, they're groups that should be out there doing that to promote this. And I think they're you know again the World Shipping Council is a good example. Here's a lobby. I could have done A and P, but I know the people at A and P. I don't want to get them pissed with me. They sometimes you know you know ask me to do things for them, but I, you they know pay I think you. <laughs> no. no i wish they paid me I, you know, nobody pays me you know that you don't pay me nobody pays me so it's just youtube youtube people pay me that's about it so anyway that was great john i appreciate it i'm going to edit this together probably pop it out on new year's eve so uh, i'll try right, to get so it out sounds there sounds great for our recap and i will send it i look forward over. to uh, say hi to jay for me jay vince meyer 
Oh, oh yeah, I'm sorry. I was I'm sorry. I didn't know a couple of J's. Tell him John. Know. John was right on his show too. I was telling you. Remember, I was telling him like this. Yeah, I, I, Ukraine. I, this is going to be good for tankers, and he's like, "Well, I think so." I got to go back. I got to go back and watch that video because we did that at the beginning of last year. So I'm interested in what we said. So I got to go back and, and look at that. So uh, I looked at ours and I was like, okay, those are good stories. We were pretty good. We were pretty good on our predictions and everything. I thought you were going to come back with the IMO again. He's all pretty... right for an Air Force guy. Yeah, that's, that's not bad. All right, man, I got to run. I appreciate it. And uh, like I said, I'll send you the link as soon as I get it up and running. All right, thanks, Sam. Bye. All right, John, talk to you later.